When I was about 10, I remember my grandfather woke us up early one morning to see a wild turkey out back. He said it might be the last time we'd ever have a chance to see one. I feel fortunate to come up through an era where we brought the turkey back. We used to travel for miles just to see a deer track. If somebody saw a deer in those days, it made the news. They just weren't around, you see. There's even a legend that when somebody said they saw one in Shannon County, they shut the courthouse down. Everybody took off to find the last deer in the county. It was such a thrill to see giant Canada geese. It was a species that we thought was extinct. Certainly, they were brought back from the brink of extinction. Now you can see them flying everywhere. It's wonderful. They're so strong, focused, and determined. And you know, for a big bird, so completely graceful. the Lord is liable to turn on us any minute. And even if he don't, our good fortune can't possibly last any longer than our natural resources. Will Rogers, 1928. By the time of the Great Depression, Missouri's land was worked hard and worn out. Plants and animals that could be found were taken for food, warmth, survival. It seemed as though nothing would ever grow here again. Across the nation, the destruction of natural habitat was taking its toll. Hunters and other conservationists realized that something had to be done, and soon. They decided to tax themselves to improve the lot of the land. In 1937, federal legislation known as the Pittman-Robertson Act established an excise tax on sporting arms and ammunition to help states restore habitats and wildlife. That same year, the Missouri Department of Conservation was formed. They had barely begun their work when the country went to war. As people of all ages left home to help with the effort, the land, which had been over-harvested, over-grazed, and literally burnt out, finally had a chance to rest and recover. At the end of nearly six years of war in Europe, it's a great day. When the veterans returned, a renewed optimism swept the nation, and an incredible story of wildlife restoration began. Here in the heartland, we were creating a richer, more diverse place. Although no longer a wilderness, Missouri over the past 60 years has seen the return of animals that were nearly gone from the wild. What follows? are the stories of seven of these and how they've become part of our landscape once again. Just in my time, the standards for a successful deer hunt have gone from just glimpsing one out of range to filling the limit. I've always thought that the old refuge managers should be given more credit for their part in restoring the deer to Missouri. It wasn't too popular to work for the Department of Conservation in the deep Ozarks in the 1930s and 40s. If a refuge manager arrested someone for killing a deer on the refuge, he and his family paid for it. His wife was snubbed in town. The kids were picked on in school. 
and often in town someone would try to pick a fight with him. It took guts to work for the department in the Ozarks in those days. It also took guts to get a deer out of a trap like this all by yourself. Here in the Ozark Hills, the mission of restoring animals to their place in the wild began. Deer seldom seen and all but gone would be first. The newly formed Department of Conservation had closed the deer hunting season and created refuges so the deer could reproduce in safety and build up their numbers. Once that was done, they were trapped and moved to other parts of the state. It didn't take them long to prosper under their newfound freedom. The other unsung hero is the female deer, the doe. She was the one that produced all the fawns that made the deer population increase. People helped, of course, but the old doe was the one that really did the work. The only trouble is she doesn't know when to stop. We have gone from where people thought it was a great thrill to see a deer track in the mud to where deer are now eating the forsythia in people's front yards in downtown Kansas City. I realized that if I had to choose, I would rather have birds than airplanes. Charles A. Lindbergh. Once touching water, our newly arrived guests set up a honking and splashing that shakes the last thought of winter out of the brittle cattails. Our geese are home again. Aldo Leopold. Giant Canada geese are home again in Missouri. They can be seen flying across the skies year round and heard from the countryside to the suburbs and cities sometimes a little earlier in the morning than we might like. Canada geese are perhaps more plentiful today than during Lewis and Clark's expedition on the Missouri River in the early 1800s. It's hard to imagine that by the 1950s, they had almost disappeared from the wild. All we had left in the state of Missouri was a few flocks in private ownership and not too many of those. And I suppose the people, you know, had had those in their families for three or four generations. And they used them for food and, and certainly they used the down for bedding purposes, which were very important in the early years. Conservationists bought one private flock of geese and moved it to a wildlife area where biologists tried to create a protected place where the birds could nest. Most of these birds are just nesting on the ground, but we were trying to get them in elevated platforms. And uh, so we put up tubs, and uh, they took to them quite well. And, and when they went to the tubs, they were more successful in producing uh, young birds because we didn't have the predator problems associated with ground nesting. The nesting success was phenomenal. We had no idea how this flock would expand. When we found out these birds were giant Canada geese, birds that were once thought to be extinct, everybody wanted them. Even in my wildest dreams, I had no idea how this group of birds would grow the way they have.
Canada geese are so common today, we tend to forget that they're still wild creatures. They announce their comings and goings with great fanfare and hold steadfast to their territory. At times, they can be a nuisance, while at others, they have a way of grabbing our attention, tempting us to pause and watch as they move across land and sky. Knowledge is in the cities, but wisdom is in the woods. Anonymous. In a thousand unseen ways, we have drawn shape and strength from the land. Lyndon Baines Johnson. Today, the turkey gobble fills the forests much as the honking of geese echoes over wetlands. By the 1950s, both were nearly silenced. The number of wild turkeys had dropped to only 2,500 or so, from about 250,000 in the late 1700s. One of the first areas that the department really started working on wild turkeys was Peck Ranch, which is in southern Missouri. It's a large block of land, and there were a few native turkeys still on the area. Is one of the reasons why it was purchased. One of the uh, early experiments uh, on Peck Ranch was using the cannon net, and uh, this had a lot of problems early on. But uh, finally, after the, some of the problems were ironed out, we were able to use it effectively to capture a large number of turkeys and move them throughout the state. Now we have turkeys in practically every county of the state. The cannon nets proved to be the best way to trap enough of the wary turkeys to make their restoration possible in Missouri. Today, people now have the opportunity to go out and view turkeys, pursue turkeys that they didn't have an opportunity to do 40 years ago. With the help of private landowners who promised to protect them from poaching, wildfires, and livestock, turkeys came back into abundance. And our wealth of turkeys made it possible to restore other animals. The state of Kentucky needed wild turkeys for their own restoration program, but didn't have anything that they could trade with us. So an arrangement was made where they would acquire wild otters from a supplier in Louisiana and trade them to Missouri for wild turkeys. It's a real neat opportunity for states that have wildlife in different levels of abundance to trade them for each other's benefit. Saw a number of large otter diving in the river before us. One of the hunters saw an otter last evening and shot at it, but missed it. Lewis and Clark Expedition Journal, 1804. When settlements expanded, river otters were displaced, losing their habitat and food supply to polluted waters from drained wetlands, cleared bottomland forests, and channelized streams. As Missouri's supreme aquatic predator, otters are strong indicators of the health of our waterways. By 1980, only a few were left in Missouri. From 1982 to 1992, we released 845 river otters in 35 different counties. From the very beginning, we invited the public. And this was really exciting because many Missourians could then witness the return of an animal that belongs in our state and had been gone for a long time. And at each release site, 
we uh, basically release about 10 males and 10 females. So we've got 10 pairs along the river. We look for about an 80 mile stretch of river that's got a lot of good pools in it, someplace that's not gonna dry up during the summertime. One of the things that's kind of significant about these releases this year is that we're nearing the end of our otter release program. And we've put almost all the animals out in all the suitable stream drainages around the state. Um, these will be the last releases that are going out anywhere in the southern part of the state. And next year we have only one release left. That'll be up in central Missouri in Boone County. And then that'll be the last one that we have scheduled. <laughs> There's a misconception about otter habitat that they require large expanses of wilderness to survive. That's not at all true. We found that otters can live and live quite well in a variety of habitats, rivers, lakes, streams, wetlands, bottomland ditches. The one thing they do need is an abundant source of food, which is crayfish through most of the year and fish in the winter, and some cover to provide refuge from their enemies and to produce their young. River otters have adapted better than anyone imagined. Today, it's not uncommon for people to see whole families of otters in streams or see them crossing the road. Just one decade after their release, they've increased tenfold in population. Missourians can be proud of the river otter's success. It means that our wetlands and streams today are clean enough to harbor a top aquatic predator. The future of otters in Missouri will always be tied to the quality of our waters. One day we asked a local man if he'd seen any roughed grouse. He said, no, but we've got the biggest darn woods quail you'll ever see. A shy and reclusive bird, the ruffed grouse is rarely seen and often mistaken. Their unique drumming sounds are becoming more common in the woods, thanks in part to the success of turkeys. Ruffed grouse were almost eliminated from Missouri about a hundred years ago, the settlers started wildfires that burned everything. Market hunters killed all they could. And finally, open range, where they turned all the horses, cattle, and hogs loose they could, just eliminated the ground nests, which, of course, grouse have. Even though we released some grouse in the 60s, it wasn't until the late 70s that we were able to trade turkeys to Indiana and get enough birds to make the program really go. And it's been so much more successful than we thought. We even have several counties open to hunting. Today, we're depending on people to manage their forest land to continue creating and promoting the habitat, the young forest stands that grouse need so much. Rough grouse is a really exciting bird. It lives in the woods and you don't often see them, but when you do, the flushing of the bird, the sound that they make, the excitement of the bird being there all of a sudden comes to you. They're part of our native Missouri wildlife. People put them in trouble and now people have brought them back. This sort of makes the whole grouse restoration a magic moment for a lot of people. For men may come and men may go, but I go on forever. Lord Tennyson in The Brook Song. Beneath the land, in a world far removed from footsteps, ancient survivors inhabit our big rivers. These primitive fish have lived since the days of the dinosaurs. 
The lake sturgeon, a gentle giant, and the paddlefish with its peculiar snout are two of the largest freshwater fish in Missouri. I think lake sturgeon are really neat. Where in Missouri could one go and find a fish that potentially can reach eight feet long and weigh 300 pounds? I think the other thing that really intrigues me about these fish is they're so gentle. They're almost like pets. Uh, in the spring, during the spawning migrations, you can actually walk out and touch these fish, and they show very, very little fear of humans. That's probably one of the things that caused their downfall, ultimately, but they're, they're amazing fish. They show very little fear. In the early 1800s, lake sturgeon were common in the big rivers of Missouri. They were actually considered a nuisance by a lot of commercial fishermen because they were big. They weighed 70 to 100 pounds, and they tore up their nets that they were used, using to fish for other species. Some enterprising steamboat captains found out that because these fish were so oily that they could actually dry them and use them for fuel in their steamboats. About the late 1800s, people found out that lake sturgeon were actually a pretty good fish to eat and they were soon overexploited. In 1984, the Conservation Department began restoring the endangered lake sturgeon to the large rivers where they could reproduce naturally. We hope to stock about another 200,000 lake sturgeon in the Missouri and Mississippi rivers. We hope that we can end up with a population of about two or three fish to the acre. Then we can take them off our endangered species list. Nature, in her blind search for life, has filled every cranny of the earth with some sort of fantastic creature. Joseph Woodcrutch, naturalist. The paddlefish is a magical, fantastic-looking fish. While its boneless body is similar to a shark's, its bizarre appearance is shared by only one living relative in China. For 400 million years, paddlefish have adapted well to the slow, subtle changes of nature. In recent years, our river systems have been altered at a much faster rate. After all this time, it's remarkable that the paddlefish in Missouri could be put at risk by a single act of man. One of the largest paddlefish populations in the world is right here in the Osage River in Missouri. This population was threatened in the 1960s by the planned construction of Truman Reservoir. We knew that the dam, which you see behind me, when it was completed and the reservoir filled, would permanently flood all spawning areas for the paddlefish. And because they would have no places to spawn, population numbers would decline and the fish would ultimately disappear. So we decided to do something about it before it was too late. So we developed techniques to spawn and raise young paddlefish in the hatchery. And now we produce and stock paddlefish to maintain population numbers in the Osage River system. We would prefer that our native fishes maintain populations naturally. But in some instances, as with the case of paddlefish, that is no longer possible. Paddlefish can live as long as 25 to 30 years and travel as much as 20 to 30 miles in a day. Despite their large size, reaching weights of 80 to 100 pounds, they are not predators. Instead, they feed almost exclusively on microorganisms which are filtered from the hundreds of gallons of water flowing through their mouths every day. The future looks good for paddlefish in Missouri. In fact, they've been managed so well that there's a special sport snagging season for them each spring. By understanding and anticipating their needs, biologists have helped maintain the paddlefish, one of our oldest and most unusual species in the state.
The richest values of wilderness lie not in the days of Daniel Boone, nor even in the present, but rather in the future. Aldo Leopold. The work of restoration, like nature, is always evolving. Today we celebrate our success, but it's tempered by a tougher challenge. Finding ways to help other animals and plants fit into our modern landscape. Much of the natural world of the past, vast prairies, forests, and wetlands, has given way over the years to farms and cities. Yet the promise of the future clearly depends on habitat. Before anything can be brought back, it must have a place to come back to. There's an old proverb that says, one generation plants the trees and another gets the shade. In just a few decades, Missourians have seen animals that were almost completely gone return to the wild in greater abundance, reminding us of a conservationist's belief that our earth is not given to us by our parents, but borrowed from our children. The really good news today is that the people in Missouri are taking care of their environment and making our restorations possible. In fact, everyone in Missouri had a stake in this. We now look back and see that this didn't happen by itself. We made it happen. We brought these animals back. <laughs> 